Dr. Huberman. Hi. The doc is in the house. Thanks for joining us this morning. How are you doing? Doing well. Sorry about the, the uh, challenge logging on there. Um, I'm in a somewhat remote location and occasionally it gets glitchy, but uh, delighted to be here. Um, and it's uh, always fun to um, do anything with uh, the, the home front, the home team. So this of is- Of course, of course. Hey, listen, this is live, so no worries. No reason to say you're sorry. So you're here and that's all that matters. Right. We're really excited to have you on Ask Me Anything. And there are a lot of questions. Hundreds of questions came in yesterday. The questions keep coming right now on the live feed. I just want to start off with something. I mean, you talk a lot about sleep and, and waking up to sunlight. And we got a lot of questions about waking up to sunlight. So I try to do a Hooverism, as I call it, and look at the sunlight this morning before our Ask Me Anything segment. And is that supposed to make you feel invigorated? What's it supposed to do if you look at sunlight first thing in the morning? Yeah, uh, great question. And I should just say that um, while in ideal circumstances, you would get up, go outside, and the sun would be out, and you look at the sun, that would be the best circumstance. You do that for maybe five, 10 minutes. Of course, allowing yourself to blink, never, never force yourself to, to look at any light, sunlight or otherwise, so bright that it's painful because you can actually damage your eyes if you force yourself to look at a bright light. Um, there are a lot of mechanisms to prevent that. But that said, um, you know, some days you'll go out, it's overcast. In that case, it can still be very bright, even though it's overcast. You don't need to look directly at the sun, just try and get a lot of that so-called ambient light, ideally with sunglasses off when you do this. Eyeglasses and contact lenses are absolutely fine, even if they have UV protection. Okay, so how is it supposed to make you feel? Well, there are a um, couple of things about this. One is the whole system of using light to set your circadian rhythm for wakefulness and to feel better throughout the day. It's what we call a slow integration system. So it's gonna tap into hormone systems and neurotransmitter systems in the brain and body that kick in over the course of minutes to hours. So it's not gonna be an instantaneous, like you know, a shot of espresso, which is what I'm drinking this morning. Um, it's going to feel more like a slow increase in your overall energy and mood. However, so we're talking, I should say, so across maybe the next, um, you know, 10 minutes to 20 minutes to hour to three to four hours. So this is a, think of it as a sustained release of energy. And, and the other thing that it does is every 24 hours, we have a pulse, a release of a hormone called cortisol. A lot of people think cortisol is bad, but cortisol is important for your immune system, for energy, provided it's not too high or too frequent. This cortisol pulse is great and it needs to arrive early in the day. And if you, by looking at sunlight, you're gonna get most of that cortisol occurring early in the day. You still have to mind your stress the rest of the day. But work from Stanford Med, from David Spiegel's laboratory and others has shown that if you don't get that sunlight early in the day, what happens is that cortisol release starts shifting later and later and creates issues with insomnia and anxiety and even some low level depression later in the day. Now that does not mean that if you miss getting sunlight one day that you're gonna get depressed. This is again, a slow integrative mechanism. So the idea should be to get this bright light in your eyes every morning for about anywhere from five to 30 minutes, depending on how bright it is outside. And to do that consistently, you might miss a day here or there, get twice as much light the next day, just stay out there twice as long the next day. You might say, well, this isn't practical. We've got kids or your family. I understand all that. I live in that landscape too. The key thing is, to you know, take your phone outside if you have to use your phone or take a walk in the morning or bring the kids outside or do breakfast outside in the morning. It can be indirect light. So it's a slow integrating mechanism over the course of hours that also lasts, believe it or not, for days. And you yeah. know this because if you've ever traveled to a different time zone, your sleep cycle is really thrown off because it's still being regulated your sleep energy cycle is, and wakefulness cycle is still being regulated by the events that happened back home a few days before. So you, I don't want to tell people to not do it every day because then they do it far too infrequently. Try to do it every day. But if you miss a day here or there, no big deal. And then the last thing is because I always get this question, which is if you wake up before the sun comes out, what do you do? Well, if you want to be awake, turn on as many bright lights as possible. And then once the sun is out, even if you're already at work, try and you know, uh, get outside for a few minutes. Don't try and do this through a window or a windshield. It just simply won't work. It takes far too long for reasons that we don't have to go into. So hopefully that covers all of the major details. I'm gonna um, just uh, tilt my screen here. Hopefully it'll stay on there, but, um, and drop down here in my studio. But, um, so hopefully that answers the question.
So you can look at, if you're, I mean, if it's dark and the sun's not out, you can stare into a lamp and that, that'll feed your, um, the sunlight factor for you or, I mean, does that work as well? Yeah, so, you know, if you're, um, if, you know, some people will buy sunlight lamps and these kinds of things. I think they're far too expensive for what they're really worth. If you, um, if you or somebody wakes up before the sun comes out, here's what I would do. I would um, get a ring light of the sort that people use for selfies I'm um, using one right now. Okay, I'm not. I'm not using one right now. It's funny. I'm looking at some of these questions. They just kind of. I'm not reading them, but they catch it. Someone asked, you know, did you dye? Your, I don't actually dye my hair. Actually, a lot grayer than this light makes me look. <laughs> um, and believe me, I'm going gray at a rapid clip. Um, no, don't dye my hair. I haven't dyed my hair since high school. I don't think, and I dyed it black when I was in high school. Why? I have no idea. Anyway, kids, don't dye your hair. The um, <laughs> the point is that it. You know, these. What you need early in the day is a lot of bright light. And now here's the kind of diabolical thing, which is that early in the day, you need a lot of bright light in order to kick these mechanisms in. And like right outside my window, if I were to turn my phone around, it's very hazy out, very overcast where I am right now. But if I were to measure the total number of photons, light energy, there's a ton of it, it's just scattered. So it looks really hazy. It's actually really bright out there, but I can't, I don't even know where the sun is, somewhere over the, you know, to my left. The point is this, if you're indoors and you have a really bright light, it seems really bright, but it's not that bright. It's just very concentrated. Mm -hmm. now, so early in the day, a ring light or something that gives you a lot of light everywhere is gonna be great. Then come about nine or 10 p.m., something switches in the system, in the eye and in the brain. And at that point, you need very little light in order to screw up this hormone melatonin and screw up your sleep cycle. So again, I don't wanna make people neurotically attached to all these protocols thinking, oh, if you go to, the, the restroom in the middle of the night and flip on the lights that you destroyed your sleep for three days. It doesn't work that way. However, I strongly recommend people dim their screens way, way down at night, way, way down, dim lights, and even better, use dim lights that are set at table height or lower. The, the cells in the eye that, that set off all these mechanisms that I'm talking about, they basically look up in the visual field. So if you have a lot of fluorescent lights overhead or you have a lot of ceiling lights, that's great during the day. And at night, you want to do the Scandinavian thing, which is to have, you know, a little lamp on the table in order to read. Or if you're going to read at night, really try and dim the light down as much as possible between about 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. And if you're a shift worker, and thank you, shift workers, we have an episode of the Huberman Lab podcast all about shift work. So you can go to HubermanLab.com and find that. It talks about using red light and different things you can do to offset some of the negative effects of shift work because they are there are a lot of detrimental effects of shift work, unfortunately. But for most people who fall asleep somewhere between 10 p.m. and midnight or 9 p.m. and midnight and wake up somewhere between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m., that's mo about 80% of the world. For most of those people, what I just described will work really well. Get as much bright light as you can early in the day, ideally from sunlight. Then later in the day, like between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m., really try and limit that light exposure. And if you go to the restroom in the middle of the night, try and use a night light. Whatever you, the minimum amount of light to perform the necessary activities you need to do safely. Right, I mean, I'm guilty as charged. I have my laptop in, you know, in bed and, I'm, you know, I'm learning from you to dim the light a little bit more because I, I have it halfway, not full blast, but that, you know, that will help. And I'm sure a lot of people out there have laptops when they're in bed or working on a late night project or something like that. It's hard to let that go, but knowing that you just gave that advice and about light and how it invigorates you and how you should have a nice sleep cycle, I think that'll help a lot. We've got a, a lot of other questions as well, sure. Andrew. Um, aside from the light, I mean, let's sort of delve into sleep because getting good night's sleep is very important for a lot of people. And we got a lot of questions about um, sleep cycles. You know, next month, we're gonna go through that whole process of changing our clocks. So what kind of advice do you have since we're going to fall back an hour, right? So we're losing an hour of sunlight, is that correct? But we get an hour more sleep, you think you are. Right, well, one more thing because before we depart from light because it relates to sleep. Mm -hmm. And if you are somebody who is going to be on your laptop or tablet or phone after 10 p.m., there's a wonderful practice that's zero cost that will help offset some of the negative effects of light late at night. And that is to see the sun or get some light in your eyes again a second time 
in the late afternoon. The, so when the sun is low in the sky, we call that low solar angle sunlight. Mm -hmm. It's just fancy nerd speak for sun low in the sky. <laughs> um, and the, the, the qualities of light at that time are very different than when the light is overhead. You'll actually notice, snap a picture of a sunrise or near sunrise. Remember, you don't have to see the sunrise across the horizon. You need to see the sun rising, right? Think the verb, don't think mm -hmm. the noun. Not sunrise, think sun rising. And then don't think that you have to see the sunset below the horizon, think sun setting, think, see the verb. Why? Low solar angle sunlight it, viewed again later in the evening triggers a different mechanism in the eye and brain that reduces the sensitivity of your visual system. It won't screw up your ability to see at all, but it makes it such that any light that you see late at night will have less of a negative impact on your melatonin production and you'll sleep better. So what I'm basically saying here is try and get outside in the morning and see the sun rising, not sunrise, but sun rising right there. The same thing, but different because when people think sunrise, they think crossing the horizon. And then mm -hmm. when people think sunset, they're more comfortable with the idea that it's setting. Okay. But so it's, it's an important distinction. And then at night, try and still avoid bright lights at night. Why? Well, here's, here's the situation with respect to daylight savings and we sleep across the year. As the earth rotates around the sun, it t it's tilted, right? So at different times of year, you get different amounts of light, the equinoxes and so forth, the solstices and equinoxes, as we know. And the um, total amount of light that you're getting from each day at certain times of year, right? You're getting less light and then days get longer again. That amount of light is directly related to how much melatonin you make because me light, inhibits melatonin. So this is getting a little tricky, but here's the point. If you look at the sun rising and the sun setting most days, your seasonal integrator, you literally have clocks in your brain that know are days getting longer or shorter. Those clocks will work better. And then when you undergo daylight savings, you'll find the shift much easier. Now, daylight savings is a human made creation, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, this is not a naturally occurring phenomenon of the movement of the planets. This is a naturally occurring phenomenon of culture. And there's a lot of debate about it. But it exists, for, at least for now, even though there's a, a lobby to, to remove it. So here's what you can do. We're heading into daylight savings. I highly recommend that when people wake up in the morning, they not only get outside, but they, they get some movement. Now, it doesn't have to be vigorous exercise. You could, you could jog. You could do jumping jacks. You could do a few air squats, but you know what? You can even just walk. You could even just pace in your driveway a little bit. A little bit of, of movement at that time will compound with, it'll synergize with the effects of light and provide a second signal to your system that that is the appropriate time to be awake. Now we're heading into daylight savings, so we're going to wake up and the sun's not going to be out. So most people are going to think, oh, well then I wouldn't want to do that. No, because you don't have light, try and get a little bit of extra movement. So if you want to get up um, a little bit later, you would delay your light exposure and your movement a little bit, 30 minutes or so, mm -hmm. heading into the weekend on Saturday or Sunday. And if you want to shift your clock the other way, you wanna start getting up earlier, force yourself to get 10 minutes of pacing around outside, and you'll notice that your clock will shift much faster. There's one other way you can do it, but a lot of people don't like this one, is you can jump in a cold shower for one minute. Oh. That will wake you up. And it's no joke, the reason it wakes you up is cold water is a absolutely reliable source of adrenaline release in the body. And adrenaline kicks off the cortisol mechanism, which then says, wake up. Very simple. Cor so cold water is, is usually cheaper than hot water. So I, I feel comfortable suggesting this. People say, how cold should it be? It should be cold enough that you really want to get out, but that you can stay safely in for a minute to three minutes. And then you can turn on the hot water if you're me. I, I'm kind of a wimp and I then turn on the hot water. Um, if you're tough, you can get out while it's still uh, still cold and head in, uh, dry off and head into your day. So, you know, it, it brings new meaning, uh, meaning to the uh, phrase, take a cold shower. So that's great advice. You know, you talked about melatonin, melatonin that is earlier, and we do have a question um, from one viewer. What are your thoughts on melatonin to take melatonin pills, I mean, or to naturally have it in your body, what is your advice about taking melatonin pills? Does it really do much good? So it, it's effective in that it can shift your circadian clock. I am a very strong believer, however, in avoiding taking 
exogenous melatonin. I, I really try to avoid supplementing with melatonin for a few reasons. First of all, it's now been well documented that many of the supplements that contain melatonin contain far too much. You know, you take three milligrams or six milligrams, that is a massive supraphysiological dose. You know, if we, people hear about steroids in sports, you know, and, you know, excessive levels of testosterone, this is like, this is literally, you know, the equivalent of this like steroid effect of people taking huge amounts of, of anabolic hormones. Melatonin is not an anabolic hormone, but typically you make very, very little melatonin, but it's effective at putting you to sleep, not keeping you asleep. That's its role to help you fall asleep. But when people take three to six milligrams of melatonin, that is a massive dose of melatonin. Now that said, melatonin has other effects on other hormones. In fact, melatonin is one of the hormones that is chronically high in children and keeps them from going into puberty until it becomes cyclic and then they enter puberty. There are other mechanisms for triggering puberty too, but melatonin in kids, I strongly discourage unless your pediatrician strongly encourages it, in which case always use the advice of your doctor to override anything that I say, um, because frankly, they're your doctor. And I'm, I always say I'm not a physician, so I don't prescribe anything. I'm a professor, so I just profess a lot of things and it's up to you. I don't say that to protect me. I say that really to protect pe people, to protect you. Now, the other issue is that the supplement industry is complicated in that not all supplements contain what they say they contain, but this is especially true for melatonin. There's been an analysis of a lot of different supposedly reliable melatonin brands out there, and the dosages can be anywhere from 15, 1.5 to 85% of what's listed on the bottle, or even 155%. So you don't actually know how much you're taking. There are healthier alternatives, but I want to really emphasize that, and I, you know, I'll probably go into my grave saying this, be, behavioral tools first, right? Unless you have a, a clinical condition and you, you need uh, a prescription drug, when many people do, use behavioral tools first, morning sunlight, avoiding too much light late at night, rely on those tools first, then rely on quality nutrition, right? If you're too hungry or if you're eating too close to bedtime, both of those can inhibit sleep. Either one can inhibit sleep, right? If you're constantly thinking about food, that's going to be difficult to sleep. If you're overly full, you're going to wake up a few hours into sleep, not feeling well. So the do's and don'ts of behavior and nutrition are going to be fundamental, right? Mm -hmm. Exercise, getting quality exercise, not drinking caffeine after two or 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Even if you can fall asleep, you're not getting the same architecture and quality of sleep. So before you start thinking about supplements for sleep or prescription drugs for sleep, it's really important to have all the other things right. And the nice thing about that is that all the other things are zero cost, right? There's nothing you have to purchase. So it's independent of budget. Now, that said, there are some supplements that have been shown to be very beneficial for sleep that are, have much greater safety margins than melatonin, and they fall into four categories. And here, again, you have to talk to your doctor. But there are, it's very clear that a variety of magnesiums can be effective in helping people fall and stay asleep. The most potent of those forms is our magnesium threonate, spelled T-H-R-E-O-N-A-T-E, magnesium threonate. Mm -hmm. as opposed to magnesium citrate, which has a kind of a major laxative effect, but to be quite direct, but, but ma magnesium threonate and bisglycinate are effective for setting a kind of a sedative motion and for enhancing the depth of sleep. And then uh, uh, something called apigenin, A-P-I-G-E-N-I-N. Do you need to take it? Not necessarily. We have a, a, a newsletter at thehubermanlab.com, which is a toolkit for sleep that talks about these things. Um, Apigenin is what's in chamomile tea. So you can also have a, a cup of chamomile tea, but guess what? Don't drink four cups of chamomile tea because you'll be waking up in the middle of the night to go to the restroom. Okay, so apigenin. So magnesium uh, three and eight and bisglycinate apigenin. And then there's a third one, which is actually used quite a lot for a variety of, of um, things, which is inositol, in particular myo-inositol has been shown to help people fall back asleep if they wake up in the middle of the night. But these are all things that you would take 30 to 60 minutes before sleep. But, and I really want to underscore this, before you start thinking about supplements, get your behaviors right, get your nutrition right, exercise. That's gonna serve so many other positive things, mood, focus, um, energy, uh, everything. Essentially, they are the foundations of mental health, physical health, and performance. And a lot of people think, oh, what should I take for sleep? Well, you should take a walk in the morning and get some sunlight. 
you should take a walk in the afternoon for five minutes, even if you have to make a call and get some sunlight. And then you should take your tablet or your phone or your computer and put it under the bed and read a book under dim light and go to sleep. So I, I'm sort of Have you been spying on me? <laughs> no, I'm only half. Listen, as I say all this, I'm far from perfect. I do my best. But last night I woke up, I went to bed very early, unusually early. I went to bed for me very early. It was like 930. I woke up at three in the morning feeling wide awake, but I didn't want to get up and out of bed. So I read under some dim light. I might have peeked at Instagram for a moment. And then I went back to sleep. But then when I woke up in the morning, I did make it a point to take a walk without sunglasses outside, even though it's a cloudy day and et cetera, et cetera. So that's a long answer about melatonin because the question to me about melatonin is really a question about supplements for sleep. There is one situation where melatonin can be very effective and largely safe if your doctor approves it. And that's for jet lag. If you really are having trouble falling asleep in the new time zone, you can do it for a day or two to adjust, but you'll still want to do all the other behaviors that are going to allow your clock to shift. And the fastest way to shift your clock when you travel is to use exercise, a cold shower to wake up, no joke, and then to eat on the local meal schedule. Don't try and eat just when you're hungry because what you're you have a clock in your gut and that gut clock is the reason why when you travel, you get some stomach discomfort and you're not feeling quite right. Jump on the local meal schedule as well. Okay. Well, you're talking about food and nutrition and I was looking at the questions coming in and one viewer is asking about the carnivore diet. What do you recommend about that? Do you support that or not? Or, I mean, it's all about healthy living, right? You're talking about sun rising, sun setting, but what right. about food? Okay, here we go. All right, nutrition is one of the most barbed wire topics on the internet. So here's the deal. We have, and I'm just gonna acknowledge that the, the variation. So you have, you have some, some extremes. At one extreme, you have pure vegan, pure plant-based, okay? In fact, there are people like Chris Gardner at, um, Chris Gardner at Stanford. He's done a lot of work who's a self, I, forgive me, Chris, if I'm getting this wrong, but I think he's a self-admitted vegan or vegetarian. I don't know about that. We had Dr. Justin Sonnenberg on the podcast. Um, talked about gut brain health. He's my upstairs neighbor at, um, at Stanford in terms of the laboratory's expert in uh, gut brain. And they've done some really important work showing that, for instance, getting one to four servings of low sugar fermented foods per day. So things like sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir, um, low sugar. Vote for right? kimchi right here. <laughs> yeah, love kimchi. Um, what, my partner makes sauerkraut for us. So mm -hmm. it's like, she's really great, makes a homemade sauerkraut and it's actually the brine. So it has to be the stuff in the refrigerated section of your grocery store. So not pickles that sit in the non-refrigerated section, but the ones that sit in the refrigerated section okay. contain ferment. Beer, yes, it's fermented, but I did an episode on alcohol. Listen, I, we can talk about alcohol, but I'm telling you, there's basically nothing good about alcohol in terms of your health. Hate to say it, folks, but no, I'll just say it now and we can talk about this more later if you want. You would have to drink so much red wine to get the needed resveratrol to maybe have a positive health effect. No alcohol is better than alcohol. And the maximum amount of alcohol that anyone can drink, and of course with kids, they should of course avoid it entirely, but the, and, and pregnant people of course, can drink before negative health effects start to really show up. And, and, and these are increased cancer risk, disrupted gut microbiome, cognition issues, et cetera, is two drinks per week. Okay, now I'm not a drinker, so for me, that's no big deal. But for a lot of people, check out our episode on alcohol and your health. I have no bias one way or the other. I don't, I'm not going to tell people what to do, but just know what you're doing. Okay, that said, getting one to four servings of fermented food per day is enormously effective, regardless of what diet you, you cover or, or you choose. Now, so you've got your vegans, vegetarians. Then you've got your omnivores, people like me. I, try, I do eat some meat and fish. I try and get it from organic, sustainable sources humanely raised and farmed. That's for me important because I love, I care about animals and factory farming is not good. It also forces me to eat less of it. I eat vegetables and I eat starches like rice and oatmeal and pasta. I do like that kind of stuff and fruit. So I'm an omnivore. And then you have carnivores. You asked about carnivore. Carnivore diet has undergone a different number of transformations. There's the so-called lion diet version of this, which is just meat. Then there's um, people will eat organ meat. So liver and pancreas and and um, really eating the so-called nose to tail, where they're eating all the heart and they're eating all the different um, organs that, with this idea that organ meat is very beneficial. It does have certain nutrients. But then now carnivore diet has now been modified to exclude, of course, it excludes grains and plants, 
But now they allow fruit in certain variations of the carnivore diet and honey of all things and certain past non-pasteurized dairy. So when we say carnivore, we're talking about a lot of different things. And there are a couple of very colorful characters out there who are associated with this um, on social media. Here's the deal. I am an omnivore and I'm an omnivore because when I look at my blood lipid profiles and I look at what's healthy for me in terms of my activity and lifestyle and need to think and stuff, I like eating some starches. But I think that for some people, it does appear, for some people, it does appear that when they get on a ketogenic or a low carbohydrate diet, for whatever reason, they do seem to experience fewer of some of the symptoms that before plagued them, like fatigue after eating or some autoimmune issues or psoriasis. There does seem to be enough anecdata out there that some people feel far better. However, many people, other people, I should say, feel far better on a pure vegan diet. So my stance is that independent of blood lipids and whether or not eating a lot of meat and organ meat is going to increase LDLs, which it probably will. And then people start debating how important is LDL. And I think most cardiologists would say very, very important. And then the people who are proponents of, of the carnivore diets would say, well, maybe not. So there's a lot of debate there that I don't want to get into. But I think that when you look across the whole, you have to ask yourself four things. What are my ethics, right? Do I want to eat animals or not? And do I want to eat animals that have been raised in one way or another, right? I've made choices about what, I won't eat any meat or any eggs or any cheese. It has to come from certain sources. That's me. Two, what are my needs? Like, am I, do, am I burning a lot of glycogen? Am I doing a lot of high intensity exercise? Do I, um, and so on. Um, three, am I monitoring my blood work? I don't suggest switching to any extreme diet, what they call elimination diet. I don't recommend elimination starches and vegetables a, a la carnivore or eliminating, frankly, protein from meat and animal sources unless you have some baseline blood work with which to compare it to eight months later. Check your LDL, check your hormone levels, right? Some people will stop menstruating. Some people's testosterone levels will drop. Some people's energy levels will go up. Some people, you know, it, it's, you need those data. And then the last thing is it really extends to what I believe is just personal choice. Ultimately, no one, unless you're being fed by your parents still, can force you to do something. And you should not be scared into following a particular nutrition plan, nor should you be duped by any ideas that one nutrition plan is is suddenly going to transform you into a different human being. But uh, with all that said, I, I know people that do exceedingly well on a vegan diet. I know people that do exceedingly well on the carnivore diet, but they are careful to monitor their blood work, especially LDLs. And I will say this, and I'm perfectly comfortable saying this, I think 90% of people out there can do really well on an omnivore diet because if they are careful about one thing, which is really trying to get 80% or more of your foods from non-processed or minimally processed foods. Oatmeal is minimally processed. It's oats that are carved up, right? You know, um, ground um, to varying degrees. An apple is completely unprocessed, right? A bag of potato chips isn't going to kill you if you have it every once in a while, but it's highly processed. How do you know something's highly processed? It has a very long shelf life. If it's not processed, it has a very short shelf life, a banana, very short shelf life. And then minimally processed foods sort of fall in between. And so I think that's the ultimate um, foundation of good nutrition is about 80% of foods minimally or non-processed. And then the other things that we discussed, I'd be happy to do a deep dive on those at some point later. Very little um, clinical trials, peer-reviewed data on carnivore, but frankly, very little about vegan diets either. And if you're an animal lover or you think that vegan is better for the planet or you're a sustainable ag, ag person who thinks that meat is better for the planet, these people are, will argue forever and ever. Meanwhile, I'll be eating rice, oatmeal, pasta, meat, fish, eggs, cheese, minimally processed or, or um, uh, you know, non-processed as much as possible. And, try and, and of course, remember, quantity of food matters too. It doesn't matter if you eat two ribeye steaks or a, or a bucket of apples. If you fill your gut with too much food, yeah. Most of the blood will be diverted there and you'll be tired. So um, if you eat too little, you'll be constantly thinking about food. And some people now do intermittent fasting, which can some people like because it, it's easier for them to not eat half, not eat at all than to eat half the croissant. I'm one of those people. So, you know, it, you really have to figure out what works for you. Mm -hmm. And and this is will change with pregnancy and kids when you, you have an illness, et cetera. 
I, I, I realize it's a long-winded question, but I, it would be unfair for me. It would be unethical for me to just say, yeah, I think that diet's great for some people. Right. I think there's a lot to consider when you're thinking about nutrition. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, hopefully that was a thorough enough answer. You know, if following a certain diet, carnivore, being a vegan, can cause a lot of anxiety. And we got a lot of questions about anxiety. One person asked, how can I stop anxiety disorder? Okay, so um, stress and anxiety are part of life, but that doesn't help. Just that I say that doesn't help. Um, there are two things that I think are really important. Um, and then a third that I'll start with. And, and that third thing is that when, you know, the word disorder is something that we want to take seriously. There are people that either for physiological or psychological reasons or a combination, right? And this could be rooted in childhood trauma, transgenerational trauma, or immediate circumstances, or just plain old physiology, you're wiring where you don't know, doesn't matter what the origins are. There are people where the anxiety is debilitating to the point where they really do need to talk to a board certified psychiatrist and or psychologist, right? Who can really do the assessment. And so I just wanna say that first, because we, I, when I hear the word disorder, it's like, what's the difference between being obsessive and having obsessive compulsive disorder? Well, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, means that the engagement in the compulsion actually increases the obsessions, right? And so that's a clinical syndrome that impairs life, right? So we talk about um, someone who's really neurotic and obsessive about eating versus someone with an, a true eating disorder, like anorexia is the most deadly of all the psychiatric conditions, incredibly high death rate. So when so I hear anorexia, that's a, that's a real thing. And someone needs to talk to an MD who can really help them parse that. So um, and again, I don't say that to like protect myself or liability. This is really, I, I, when I hear the word disorder, that means something specific. And we are, of course, Stanford Med. med and so we have excellent people here and people have excellent, um, hopefully, medical resources near them to talk about disorders. Okay. Now, that said, everyone has anxiety at some point. And here's what's interesting. We don't have a lot of ways to know how anxious we should or shouldn't be. All we have is this tool, which we call language, to say, I'm anxious, I'm feeling low, I'm feeling stressed, I'm feeling, you know, we know when we're comfortable, we know when we're uncomfortable. We all have varying levels of um, understanding about how comfortable or uncomfortable we are. You know, some people are just not aware that they're stressed. And some people, because of cultural, familial, or circumstantial reasons, just don't feel comfortable talking about their anxiety. Some people will text and to call you all the time with their anxiety. So a lot of people are anxious who look calm right? And that's important to remember. Okay. I do believe that there should be tools for this. And my lab and David Spiegel's laboratory um, have been working on tools for this. Uh, Dr. Aliyah Crum um, at Stanford, also at Stanford. So it has excellent work on this. I think that we need two kinds of tools, real-time tools to push back on anxiety and stress in real time, and then tools that raise our threshold so that we can tolerate more of life before we hit that stress threshold. And there are ways to do that. And we have a study that's in its very late stages now, but I'm happy to share with you some of the tools from that study. Again, this is a collaboration with our Associate Chair of Psychiatry, David Spiegel. There's a tool based on a natural pattern of breathing that we do in sleep that is very effective at reducing anxiety in real time. And it's called the physiological sigh. This was not discovered by me. This was discovered by physiologists in the 30s. And what it is is that during sleep, every once in a while, a level of a gas in your bloodstream called carbon dioxide will get too high and your levels of oxygen will get too low and you're actually becoming asphyxiated. And you don't know it because you're asleep. And under those conditions, you will do a double inhale through your nose and then a long exhale through your mouth. So it looks like this. It's gonna take me a second to do. I'm gonna inhale really deeply through my nose and then when I feel my lungs are full, I'm going to make every effort to sneak in a little bit more air. I'll tell you why in a moment. And then I'm going to release all my air. I'm going to empty all the air in my lungs, but through my mouth. So this is one physiological sigh I'm about to perform now. Now, let me try that. Did I do that right? Double inhale through the nose, long exhale. That's what it looked like to me. So inhale through the nose. Let's do it again. And then another inhale. And then long exhale through the mouth, all the way to lungs empty. Great. That, that pattern, good. Yeah, that pattern of breathing does something very special. 
And this is work that was also done by Mark Krasnow, a Howard Hughes investigator and another faculty at Stanford Med. The lungs are two big bags of air, but they have hundreds of millions of little sacs called the alveoli of the lungs that increase the surface area of your lungs. When you are stressed, you tend to underbreathe. You might think stress makes you breathe really hard. You're actually underbreathing or breathing in a way that carbon dioxide goes up in your bloodstream. These little sacs collapse like little balloons and they're damp on the inside. And so like a balloon that's damp on the inside, they don't want to reinflate very easily. And you need to do a long exhale in order to get rid of all the carbon dioxide that's built up in your system and is making you stressed. So the physiological sigh is like if you've ever um, tried to blow up a balloon for a kid at a kid's party mm -hmm. and you go, you actually do too. You go, and it pops. Oh, it doesn't pop the balloon, but it inflates the balloon and then you can fill it up. And then when you exhale, you get rid of all the carbon dioxide or a lot of it, I should say. So we've done studies now in the laboratory and there are other studies that have taken place at UCLA and elsewhere that show that one to three physiological size is the fastest way to calm down. When someone sees you stressed and says, take a deep breath, what they really should say is take a long exhale. But what would be even better is for them to say, inhale twice through your nose, until your lungs are completely full and then exhale through your mouth, a so-called physiological sigh. Watch the next time your dog goes down for sleep. It will do one of these right before falling asleep. It'll go. I've seen that. Oh my gosh. Or if someone has ever been sobbing, when we cry, we actually are running out of oxygen. Um, okay. So the physiological sigh is not a hack. A hack is something where you take advantage of something that's not normally used for something and you use it for something else. This is the beautiful thing about the physiological sigh is that it works the first time and it works every single time. Now, it's not going to get rid of the problem that might be causing you stress or anxiety. I wish I had a magic wand for that, but it will reduce your stress levels. And if you are in bed at night, for instance, and you're having a hard time falling asleep, try doing a few physiological sighs and really extending that exhale. And you'll notice your core, your diaphragm, and, your, and your, your, your stomach region will start to relax. This actually feeds back to the nervous system, which then to the brain, which then feeds back to the body to relax it. So I always say, when you can't get your mind where you want it to go, use your body to control your mind, right? If you can't talk yourself out of anxiety, use, use your physiology, use your breathing. And, uh, you know, and so this is the kind of thing where you can use this anytime, I suppose, unless you're underwater. Now, that's, what, that's how you push back on stress in real time. Now, how do you increase your stress threshold? How do you get more resilient? You know, we hear about grit, resilience, and mental toughness. How do you lean into life? How do you cope better? Well, the best way to cope is to not get stressed in the first place. But if you do- Easier said than done, right? Easier said than done, to feel comfortable at that level of stress. And in order to do that, you need to do a sort of self-directed stress inoculation. And there are a couple of ways to do that. What you essentially need to do is get comfortable with having a spike of adrenaline, with having adrenaline in your body. Many people are not familiar with the feeling of their heart racing or um, in a so this can happen in a social setting. One of the ways I notice it happens a lot in uh, work-based social settings or classrooms is you'll go into a room, you'll sit down and they'll say, okay, we're going to introduce ourselves. We're going to go around the room and everyone say your name and something about yourself. And you start listening to other people and then you start thinking, what I'm going to say, who's, you know, what am I going to say? And people start getting nervous about this, right? You know, you're, and it's because you're, there's an what we call an anticipatory circuit in the brain and body. You're getting ready to speak, but you're not able to speak. And then adrenaline is going up. You're thinking, do you, am I going to sound stupid? Or maybe you're heading out on the stage or you're going to the doctor's office and you're afraid of the, the blood pressure measure, or you're going to have a hard conversation, you know, a myriad of examples of things that can increase adrenaline. So here's the key. And this is a statement made by, again, my colleague, David Spiegel, who I simply adore as a person and as a collaborator. He's just so, so unbelievably smart and creative. And he works on this stuff in the laboratory in humans, as we do, but his words are, there's something very powerful about self-inducing a state. Like the stress isn't arriving from the outside. You're creating that sense of, of stress deliberately. And there are a couple ways to do it. You need to increase adrenaline, but you need to do it in a healthy way. Well, what can you do? Well, you could take a cold shower and learn to stay calm or to calm yourself with the inevitable increase in adrenaline. Remember, adrenaline is non-negotiable. It's how you navigate 
that choppy waters, as I like to think about them, of adrenaline in your system. So you can train that by doing a cold shower every morning or even in the afternoon, if you like, for a minute to three minutes. You will get better at tolerating stress because the next time someone comes up to you or you see a text message that says you missed your 1030 meeting, this is something that happens to me a lot. I'm just terrible with schedules. I just <laughs> I have a lot of flaws, but among my 3000 flaws, um, 3000 plus flaws is that I'm terrible at, at coordinating schedules. And yes, I know there are a lot of devices for it. it does not work. I'm an academic after all. The absent-minded professor is a real thing. So I'll look at my text messages like, oh my goodness, I was supposed to be in a meeting 15 minutes ago. Rather than, you know, allow that to derail your thinking, that shot of adrenaline will become a familiar place. Like, oh, I've, you know, I've rafted on a river that felt choppy like this before. It, you, it becomes a more familiar state and you're able to then maybe do a physiological sigh or just cognitively realize that you're not gonna be taken away by the current of that adrenaline. So cold shower is great. There's another way you can do it, which is the opposite of the physiological sigh. And we have a study on this as well, which is using what's called cyclic hyperventilation. One of the best ways to self-direct increases in adrenaline is to deliberately hyperventilate. And if you, I'll do this now. I so would suggest that people who have anxiety not do this when they're in an anxious state and to ease into it over time, because it will very quickly liberate adrenaline into your body. And it essentially looks as if it sounds. You go in through the nose, out through the mouth, repeat it. So you go, and after about 10 to 20 of those, you're gonna feel warm, you're gonna feel agitated, you're gonna feel a little bit of burning in your nostrils. That's adrenaline. And then here's what you do. You exhale all your air, wait maybe 10, 15 seconds, and then repeat it a second time or even a third time. Now, be very careful. If you're somebody who's prone to panic attacks, you might throw yourself into a panic attack. But if you're somebody who suffers from, you know, moderate levels of anxiety and you want to build up some resilience, try five breaths for a few days, one round, and then maybe 10 breaths for a couple of rounds the next days, et cetera. What you'll notice is that over time, meaning you don't need to do this every day, if you just do it two or three days a week, or maybe even three or five days a week, it only takes about a minute or two. The, the incredible thing is that the threshold for adrenaline release starts going up. So then you get that text message, or you're feeling overwhelmed by all the deadlines you have, but you notice that you're calmer in the face of all that. Now, like any training tool, it needs to be kept up. So I would say, you know, one to three times per week when you start, don't feel the need to do it seven days a week. And please don't do any kind of hyperventilation or breath holding anywhere near water, right? You don't want to pass out and drown. And I'm not, I'm not being extreme here. You know, people try and use this as ways to stay underwater longer, which is actually very, very dangerous. But the point is this, you can use a cold shower, you can use um, cyclic hyperventilation. Some people will say, well, can I use exercise? Not really, I mean, it's hard to get a lot of adrenaline into your system unless you're running for your life. I mean, you could, you could try and scare yourself, but that's not good. You know, uh, everyone's now talking about all these Netflix specials that are super scary. I don't like to watch those. <laughs> um, you know, you could use that. Halloween that's, is that's, coming up, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Halloween's coming up. So th the point is this, that while the number of things that can induce anxiety are near infinite, the number of mechanisms to control anxiety are very straightforward. One you use your breathing, your respiration. Once you've calmed down from a physiological sigh, or maybe two physiological sighs, then you use your cognition. You can use your thinking, try and be rational about your situation. When you are in a state of anxiety or panic, you can't be rational. Your forebrain, your prefrontal cortex is actually reduced in activity and you become sort of basic. People say things like in your limbic brain or in your lizard brain, what they're really saying is you're, you're more evolved parts of your brain that can plan and make good predictions and really understand bigger context that this too shall pass, et cetera, that brain area actually shuts down quite a bit. So by doing a physiological sigh or two, you're going to lower your anxiety, then you can think. And if you need to do it again, do it again. And then if you want to get more resilient, you can use the cold shower approach. You can use cyclic hyperventilation, but ease into it slowly. And then I would say over time, Pay attention to how much anxiety you're experiencing each day. And if you are somebody who's just getting these big spikes in anxiety, ask yourself a few questions. Are you sleeping well and long enough 80% of the nights of your life?
Because if you're not, the probability you're going to have an anxiety issue or even full-blown disorder is much higher. Again, sleep is the foundation of mental health, physical health, and performance of all kinds, okay? If I want to pull someone apart, sleep deprive them. If I want to make you better at something, I'm going to get you more deep sleep, okay? That's just the, the way it goes. Get that morning sunlight. Get exercise, good nutrition, social connection, et cetera. If you're doing those things, the probability of anxiety will go down, but it never goes to zero. And with all that said, there's something very important to understand, which is that for some people, they, I, for whatever reason, and there are many reasons, is they have so much depression or anxiety that doing all the things I'm describing, like getting good sleep and sunlight and social connection, become near impossible to impossible, right? So there's a way in which things can get so rough that you can't actually do the things you need to. And we need to have real compassion for those people. Those people really need to talk to a board certified physician or clinical psychologist and, and figure out how they can get into a mode where they can start doing all the behavioral, nutritional, et cetera, tools, okay? So it's not fair to say you just gotta do the right things because there is a point beyond which people just don't seem capable of doing that, in which case they need support to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, of mental thoughts, you, you touched on this earlier. What about the whole theory of having healing thoughts, you know, going through, you know, visions and images, meditation to sort of heal yourself, be it a psychological or, or a physical injury? Yeah, this is a really important question. And here I, I have to say, I love the work of so many scientists and clinicians out there and colleagues of mine at Stanford. But I have to say the work of two people in particular, Dr. David Spiegel, who I've mentioned multiple times, but also Dr. Ali Crum, Aliyah Crum over on, on the, um, she's not on the med side of campus, but she works with us as, as well. She works on mindset effects and these are not placebo effects. And here's the deal and here are the data from her lab. She's an amazing, amazing scientist, so creative and um, was on our podcast if you wanna check out an episode with her. If people, watch a five minute video about how destructive stress is and then you measure hormones and various things related to the stress response a lot of bad things show up blood pressure increases changes in hormones that are bad if you take another group of people and you tell them for five minutes all the things that stress does for us like believe it or not stress activates our immune system if you've ever pushed push 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 finals or worked really hard or taking care of somebody or somebody who's been sick and then you stop, go on vacation and you get sick, that's because your stress level dropped. Adrenaline and cortisol activate the immune system. They're not good for the memory system, but they're good in the short term, they're okay. But in the long term, it's not good. But remember, you're, it would be crazy, it wouldn't make any sense if you know, in times of famine, right, you're stressed and your immune system crashes, right? Stress, it bolsters the immune system in the short term. This is kind of interesting. So what you tell people that, which is true, by the way, and guess what happens? Their markers, their blood pressure goes down, their immune system function goes up, and so on and so forth. These are not placebo effects. These are belief effects that are mediated through real physiology. So that's important. The information, now you say, well, wait, I don't control what I read in a newspaper article. I hear all this terrible news, right? The world is ending, and sometimes it does seem as if, you know, we're headed for cat catastrophe. What do you do with that? Well, you need to balance that out also with information that's positive and that can include positive thoughts. Belief effects are very real. And in fact, the work of David Spiegel is mainly focused on clinical hypnosis, not stage hypnosis, but clinical hypnosis, where you self-direct your thinking is very powerful. There's a terrific app. It has a free component, so I feel comfortable suggesting it. And it has a paywall component if you want to get into it more depth. The app was based on work done at Stanford Med. And the app is called Reverie, R-E-V-E-R-I. You can go to reverie.com and they have a couple of free scripts there where you listen to them to self-direct things like positive thinking, healing from trauma, healing from physical pain. They're, they're, these are based on really beautiful peer-reviewed and clinical studies from the Spiegel lab showing, for instance, reduced chronic pain, showing improved outcomes to chemotherapy, showing the need to take less medication for particular conditions, showing improved focus, improved neuroplasticity, brain change, and, and uh, learning, and on and on. And they have these different scripts. A very, and the cost, actually, if people do decide to go behind the paywall, is fairly nominal compared to, say, a supplement or a class. And it's really wonderful. And this, again, is, is not stage hypnosis. This is you using particular states of deep relaxation combined with specific 
imagery to rewire your brain. And, um, you know, it sounds kind of wild, but, you know, these days there's a lot of excitement about psychedelics. There's a lot of excitement about EMDR. There's a lot of excitement about all these novel therapies, electric shock therapy, TMS, um, uh, you know, ultrasound. Actually, today I'm sitting down with someone, Nolan Williams from Stanford Med, who works on transcranial magnetic stimulation and ultrasound for psychiatry. So those things are, have their role. But again, let's go to our foundation. Behaviors first. Wouldn't it be beautiful if there was something that we could do just with our mind, with our thinking, that's essentially zero or very low cost, a 10 minute or even they even have one minute hypnotic scripts that, have, that are based in real research on a huge variety of people that could help us rewire our thinking and our, our ability to heal and, and to deal with you know, psychological and or physical pain um, better. And in fact, that tool exists. And you can find it in Reverie, or you can, if you're not interested in Reverie, you can, um, you can try a different tool. This is a tool that, again, my lab has, has been working on. It's uh, called NSDR, Non-Sleep Deep Rest. It's a really wonderful tool. If you go to YouTube, you put NSDR, you put my last name, and a company named Virtusan very, very graciously put it out there for at zero cost. What is it? You, some people will recognize this as a kind of meditation, but it's not meditation. Meditation involves focusing very hard on your breathing or on your so-called third eye center or on your, your sensation. That's not what it is. It's also not hypnosis. It involves bringing your nervous system into a state of deep relaxation. And it has been shown to have four major positive effects. The first is, is that it can re replenish levels of dopamine, which are levels of, which is a molecule, excuse me, responsible for motivation and actually can improve motor function and cognitive function. Two, it can help you replace some of the sleep that you might not be getting. At night, if you're not getting enough sleep, you can do this when you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, I'm still tired. You can do this for 10 minutes or you could do it in the afternoon. Third, there does seem to be some at least early data on improvements in cognitive function for people to do this regularly. By regularly, I don't necessarily mean every day, although I personally do it every day. And I admittedly, I do sometimes listen to my own NSDR. I know that's weird, but anyway. Um, and there are others out there, of course, that you can find easily. And then last but not least, if you're somebody who has trouble falling asleep or falling back asleep after you wake up at night, doing this then or any time of day will help you learn to relax your nervous system in a self-directed way. Again, without the use of ingesting anything. It's just using a way of shifting your brain. And here I'm stealing from the yogis, from thinking and doing and planning to modes of pure sensation. Right. I mean, the, the brain can either be anticipatory of the future or it can even be worrying about what's happening right now. You know, a lot of people say you're future tripping or you're just focused on the past. That's very new agey language. But in reality, what we're talking about is in order to fall asleep, or in order to relax, you need to turn off that prefrontal cortex a little bit. This is what alcohol does do, unfortunately, because a lot of people have a drink or two because it relaxes them. They don't think about stuff so much. Their thoughts become a little bit more disorganized and kind of, you know, a little bit more dreamlike, right? If we were in a dream right now, anything could happen. It'd be fine. This cup could, you know, fly through the screen and be like, oh yeah, great, you know? And then a, a dog could pour out of it and we'd say, okay, you know, that's what, I, that's what happens when your frontal cortex is turned off. And NSDR, non-sleep deep rest, is a term that admittedly I coined because it includes things like yoga nidra, if you want to look that up, that's a, another form of this that includes a few more kind of mystical type things. And so NSDR we brought as a term to, um, to describe self-directed relaxation that includes the opportunity to self-direct certain brain changes in terms of how you think once you exit the NSDR. And I'll just mention as an, as an external endorsement, I've never met him and I certainly didn't um, pay him to say this, but the, the CEO of Google is a big proponent of NSDR. He's talked about this pretty extensively. Athletes at Stanford are using it. People in elite military are using it very extensively because they do these very challenging deployments where it really is ultra high risk, high consequence, right? And a lot of now um, emergency medical teams are using this because they don't have time to go take a nap. They have maybe only 10 minutes to decompress. So NSDR is a wonderful practice. Reverie is a terrific tool. Keep in mind the work of Dr. Aliyah Crum, Ali Crum. Um, again, if you want to learn more, we did a whole podcast episode with her. You can find everything at zero cost at hubermanlab.com. Very easy to just navigate to that. And she's doing incredible work on how what we say to ourselves over and over really does seem to have an impact. 
but as I say that, I want to be really clear. A lot of people get scared by that because they think, wow, their self-talk is really negative. Is that, is that really having a negative effect? Well, yes and, and no. I mean, on the one hand, it, it could. But the good news is, is that you can rewire that over time. But you're not going to do that by white knuckling and by forcing yourself to have positive thoughts. You can't lie to yourself and say, I'm great, I'm great, and believe that you're great. What you need to do is bring your brain into a state of deep relaxation and then start to incorporate the belief systems that Aliyah's lab and other people um, are studying and that our lab is studying. And NSDR is a terrific way to do that. And Reverie is another way to do that. Listen, this segment is called Ask Me Anything. So we have a lot of questions um, about you personally and about your career. And one of them is, did you ever face any challenges while you were studying neuro neuroscience? I mean, you, come on, this is an example today, this segment about how you relate science to everyday life. But in your path to studying neuroscience, were there any challenges there? Oh, goodness. Uh, yes. Um, oh, Did you goodness, take a lot yeah. of deep breathing exercises to get through it? <laughs> oh, my. You know, I, I'll try and keep this brief. And um, I appreciate the question, um, not because it's about me, but because I think it really is about everybody. Um, I mean, I can look to, for example, um, as an undergraduate, because I did not have a strong high school career, really feeling like I was coming from behind. And I was, you know, I, I for reasons that were very personal to me and my family at the time, and uh, I did not perform well in high school. And, um, you know, I had to, I felt like I had to work so much harder in college to, to keep up and to catch up, to catch up, really. I also, um, I also, as a graduate student, for instance, um, I had a, a, you know, a number of, of personal losses, you know, deaths of people close to me. Um, as a graduate student, you know, I had a close friend commit suicide. Um, it, you know, I had relationships end, you know, and that felt at the time catastrophic, right? I mean, luckily things moved on just, you know, it, so many things. I mean, so many things. And yet acknowledging that I also had a lot of advantages there for me, right? I knew people in graduate school who were raising kids in graduate school. I wasn't. So I, I wasn't, I was only responsible for myself ultimately. Um, when I was a postdoc, had a wonderful time as a postdoc in Ben Barris's lab here at Stanford Med, but I wasn't taking very good care of myself physically my sleep started going off and I wasn't exercising that regularly because I was working a little too much. And then I started having challenges getting, you know, getting things done. And so I realized I needed self-care was fundamental to my ability to work well, starting to think about exercise and sleep and sunlight as part of my self-care that was not selfish, but would allow me to show up better. Um, and on and on and on. Now I've been very fortunate in that I've never been somebody who's um, had any propensity at all for drugs or alcohol. So I didn't ever feel like I needed to rely on substances. But there were times, for instance, where in order to get the amount of work done that I need to do or studying, I, I'll be honest, there were times that were kind of lonely. I'm, I'm very blessed to have a lot of close friends. And especially now, my life is rich with amazing friends and relationship and all that. But there was a time when it was exceedingly lonely. And I felt like I loved the work. But there I was again, like leaving the laboratory at one in the morning and some days feeling elated because everything went well and other days feeling like, wow, like kind of in a time warp. So again, you know, this isn't about me. The point is that everyone I would think has challenges. And, and the key is to really remember the foundations of health that are going to allow you to navigate, not just graduate school, but anything and everything. And I think nowadays we're starting to look at self-care uh, as a good friend of mine, um, and uh, amazing clinician uh, refers to it as sort of a first principles of self-care. Look, get quality sleep 80% of the nights of your life. Just work at it. Don't obsess over it, but just really try. And if you're not, if you're going to stay up all night or have a late night, make sure, try and make it for good reasons. And if you get a bad night's sleep for whatever reason, don't obsess. There's that. There's the need for social connection. There's the need for good nutrition that you deserve to take good care of yourself, cardiovascular exercise, or if you like going to the gym, or we have tons of episodes about how to get all that. Also, the social connection piece, I'm actually pretty introverted. I talk a lot, I realize. I'm not known for being succinct, but the social connection piece is vital. That could be one friend, it could be your dog. I mean, I, I, my dog passed away, but before that, I mean, time with Costello was like the best. It was like the best. It was, it, the things that fill you up and renew you. 
So learning to reset in non-destructive ways. This is key. This is why I, I think whatever it is, even if it means meeting a couple friends for a glass of wine or two, if that's you know, within your health, your spectrum of health, beha healthy behaviors, great. That's great for you. Find the things that reset you and allow you to feel a sense of aliveness and meaning again and do them consistently. Don't wait until you crash. And I think in this culture of go, 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 especially in the Bay Area, but now really everywhere, um, we can really start to overemphasize the work piece to the, to the expense of everything else. And I've found that over time, the best way to perform well in work is to really try and focus when I'm working, really be in the work. Don't split my attention as much as possible. And then when I'm socializing, really try and be in those interactions, try and get, keep the phone off the table if I can, really try and drop in, be, be a good listener, engage with the kids, engage with family members. If you don't have people, you know, a pet or an animal, you know, even a plant. I mean, goodness, uh, taking care of my plants sometimes. Uh, right now, I don't have any. That was fun. The little things go a long way. And so the short answer is yes, yes, yes. I have, you know, and I will say this. I have the unfortunate um, consequence. My first uh, scientific advisor committed suicide. The second one died of cancer. And the third one died of cancer. So I'm, I had amazing advisors. But along the way, I lost my scientific parents which for me was really challenging, but what it eventually turned into through some, a lot, a lot of long walks and, and journaling and understanding is that, um, you know, our time here is limited and to try and enjoy it as much as possible while also putting yourself into things that really give you a sense of, of what I, what I think Jungian psychology would call aliveness and to really try and do that. I don't want to be abstract or overly sentimental here. Really, really try and orient towards those things. And in that sense, I, I think of all three of those individuals as just a great blessing for my life. And, and so I'm just trying to show up and, and learn as much as I can and share as much as I can and give as much as I can. Because at least for me, that's, that's what gives me a sense of aliveness. But I'm not going to neglect my self-care along the way. Not now, and, um, but I certainly did uh, uh, coming up. Well, you're certainly showing your aliveness in your podcast. I mean, you're one of the top 25 podcasts in the country. That's impressive. We've got some questions about that in terms of, you know, there are a lot of celebrities following you, Andrew. So how do you feel about that, that you are a celebrity magnet? Uh-oh. Um, well, I don't know how to quite answer that. You know, I live a very, um, uh, my, my world is pretty small in terms of my day-to-day -day routine. You know, I uh, wake up, my partner and I take a walk, um, get our sunlight, um, and I delay my caffeine intake by 90 to 120 minutes, just like I say on the podcast, to avoid that afternoon crowd. I do all those things, and I read, you know, right? I've got stacks of papers here. We have an episode on cannabis coming out on Monday, and a very interesting topic. I'm not a cannabis user, but very interesting topic to me anyway. I read. I organize my notes. I listen to a few other podcasts. I make calls to experts in the field. That's what, um, that's how I spend my days. And I exercise and I try and take good care um, and be a good uh, partner and friend and son and brother. Um, but, you know, I'm absolutely um, moved and delighted that people are so interested in learning and the podcast. I never thought in a million years that, I'd be doing this. Uh, just my good friend, Lex Friedman from MIT said, you should start a podcast. He said this at the end of 2020. And he said, but whatever you do, don't just blab into the microphone. You should interview people. So we interview people every other episode. And then I, um, and so thank you, Lex. He has an amazing podcast. Carl Dyserhoff has been on that podcast. He's a lot of scientists as well, Elon Musk and, and so forth. Um, if you haven't heard of Elon Musk, you can look him up on the internet. And that was a joke. The, um, the, the, it's been wonderful. I will say that, um, getting to know some people who are very well recognized celebrities and, and people in high places and surgeon generals and people like that has been, um, has been wonderful for me, to be honest, the real, um, the real joy of it is in the learning and sharing. And the, the ultimate feedback for me, frankly, is when I hear like, Oh, I'm, someone will say I'm sleeping better or gosh, I felt so alone in my uh, experience, uh, not me personally, but someone will say that they felt so alone in their experience of, an eating disorder or bipolar or topics that we've covered on the podcast or, oh, you know, I, I don't have people will say I don't have the budget to um, 
you know, to buy these books on fitness and here, you know, with your episode with Dr. Peter Atia, I now know I need to do 180 minutes of zone two cardio per week. I'm getting all the information I need at zero cost. That to me feels um, the most rewarding. And then I should also say, you know, one of the things that we're gearing up toward that's actually already started, but we've been quiet about this and we're doing this with Stanford Med is that um, we're using some of the, um, some of the resources from the podcast and we're we have now a philanthropic arm where um, through the generosity of some donors, they're matching some funds raised from the podcast to support science and student scholarships and things of that sort. So we'll be announcing what we've been doing and what we are doing going forward. That's really, to me, it's like an ecosystem. I get to learn, which I love. Ever since I was a little kid, I would spend my weekends and weeks reading. Then I'd go and I used to try and give lectures in class when I was a little kid, they, it was a problem, but now I get paid to do it. So that's fine. And where I do the podcast tell the world about it. So I'm happy. Hopefully people are happy with the information they're learning from and enjoying it and or enjoying it. And then some of the resources that are developed through that can then feed back into the very science that, that feeds that whole ecosystem. So it, I like to think everyone wins and that regardless of income or budget or where they live in the world, because the internet if they have an internet connection that they can get the information that that that's the most gratifying thing and um celebrity has never really done much for me like i i there are a few uh musicians and actors and things i have a few heroes one of them is oliver sacks the great neurologist oliver sacks he unfortunately passed away uh, another one was ben barris um you know my heroes are are those sorts of people who are living a life of like intense passion for their craft and are so caught up in it that they're not thinking about whether or not people are even paying attention. But of course I love a good movie and um, you know, that, or not, I don't have my, my favorites. So, um, you know, and listen, celebrities pay a huge, you know, not, people always say um, it would be so great to be well known, but with recognition, you give up your anonymity, right. your ability to walk down the street. So anyway, I moved that people are excited by the information and I would encourage anyone who, um, has a passion for learning and sharing and or sharing to just really follow that passion. It will lead you good places. I guarantee it. Well, celebrities or not, we certainly learned because you shared a lot. And I mean, we went through exercises with sun rising, sun setting, cold showers, um, breathing for stress relief. What is it again? Let's do it again. It's All right. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> And hyperventilating, you know, exercises for that, how to stop anxiety disorder. You, you know, the topics run, ran the gamut this morning. And we surely appreciate you being on Ask Me Anything because you answered a lot. So we also want to remind folks that we will uh, be posting a recording of this Ask Me Anything segment. And also want to encourage folks out there to follow you and to also follow Stanford Medicine. Andrew, it was a pleasure for you, for us, that is, to for you to be here on Ask Me Anything. And hopefully we can ask you back on here again so we can ask you anything a lot more. So thank you. thank you. Thanks everyone for joining and, and thank you for hosting me. I mean, Stanford Med is my employer and my primary employer. And I, I have to just say, I, I, I so appreciate this opportunity, but also want to say I so appreciate that the leadership at Stanford and the faculty at Stanford have been so supportive of the podcast and, and what we're doing. And it's a truly amazing place. I mean, Stanford is just, there's no place like, I know there are other excellent places too, but it's an amazing place in their ability to be forward thinking that people are kind, everyone's mission driven. Please do follow Stanford Med, everybody. It's, a, it's such a wonderful place and a community to be a part of and following the Instagram and, and Twitter is a great way to be part of the community. Thank, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew. And we're lucky to have you. Stay tuned for the next Ask Me Anything segment. Thank you for joining us today. Bye for now.